we live in a really complicated, colourful, busy world. There's many things to look at, many things to hear, lots of sources, objects, events, all vying for your attention. And if you're going to survive in this world, you have to be capable of assessing what's out there around you so that you can make decisions and, and actions based on that. And when I say you, I of course mean your brain. So this is my brain, but yours would look pretty similar. And the question is, how do we get information about the world into the brain? Because there's a problem here, the brain can't interact directly with the world because the brain lives in a box. We have, fortunately, mechanisms for getting information into the box. One of them is the eyes, one of them is the ears, and that gives us our sense of vision and our sense of hearing. Of course, we can also touch things, we can smell things, we can taste things. So effectively, your brain is actually bombarded with sensory information from all of these sensory systems all of the time. But that information is very different if you consider your sense of smell and compare it to, say, vision, or even hearing or touch. These are very, very independent estimates of what you actually have going on in the world. And some of them change as you look around, for example, whereas others of them, like your smell, perhaps, doesn't change. So how do we merge these different senses into our perception? Because our perception is seamlessly multisensory. It's really hard to think of an occasion when you actually have a unisensory experience. If I ask you to describe an object or a memory or an occurrence, you're almost certainly likely to use words that describe how it looked, but also perhaps what you heard, what smells were around. So somehow this information has to be put together. And what I'm going to sort of question today is actually to what extent your sensory systems do give you independent views of the world. So the textbook idea of the brain is something like this. So we have a cartoon here, we have our brain, and we have two regions marked. So the idea is that information comes in from your eyes, it travels through the brain stem, and it goes to this orange area, your visual cortex, which is at the back of your brain. And this is actually a number of areas, and they process information hierarchically so that as you sort of ascend the visual system, you get areas that extract increasingly complex features from a visual scene. We have similar things going on in the auditory system, so your cochlea detects sounds, your midbrain processes it, and it eventually arrives at this blue part here, the auditory cortex, which sits sort of on the side of your head. And it too is multiple areas, each of which have different functions. And within this model of the brain, which until five or 10 years ago was really how we believed the brain worked, all of the processing really that you needed to see or to hear went on in these separate areas. But we now know that actually, that's too simple a model. So the areas are indeed dominated by one sense, but the boundaries between them are blurry. And in fact, even at the very earliest stages of neural processing, there's crosstalk between these areas. How do we know that? And what function does it serve? Those are really the two questions that I'm going to address. So your brain is made of neurons. Neurons are stained in this picture on the right here. They're the nerve cells, the building blocks with which the brain is made. And if we're going to examine brain function, there are a number of ways that we can do that. And we can do so at different scales. So human imaging techniques, functional imaging techniques, allow us to assess the neural circuits and networks that are involved when a person is performing a particular type of task. And over the last decade, they've really improved and developed to a really sophisticated level where we can really accurately pinpoint neural circuits underlying, for example, perception. But even though the spatial resolution of these techniques is pretty good, it's a, sort of, of the order of a millimeter, a millimeter cubed is, is thousands of neurons. So while these techniques can tell you a lot about where things happen in the brain, they're actually quite limited in telling you what the mechanism might be when we look at a single cell level. At the opposite extreme, we can record from single neurons. So this gives us observations at a kind of micrometer level of precision. But of course, we have to remember that every nerve cell in the brain is connected to approximately 10,000 others. So while we can record from more than one neuron at a time, perhaps tens of neurons, we're only ever going to see really a snapshot of what's going on in the, the complicated network that's processing things. But it's the second technique that my lab uses. So we record from single neurons by inserting very small electrodes. And we record electrical signals. So neurons communicate with one another using electrical impulses, small bursts of electricity, which we call action potentials or spikes. You can think of it as them talking to one another almost in Morse code. And the sort of data that we get might look something like this. So we have a noisy trace here. That noise represents probably neurons that are distant from our electrode. But on the top, you can see these big amplitude spikes. These are the action potentials. 
these are a neuron that's sitting close to our electrode firing its electrical impulses. And we can zoom in on them and, and plot a number of them, one on top of the other. We can see that they have a consistent shape. That tells me that all of these spikes I can see here probably come from the same neuron. And actually, because this is a voltage, I can play it out through a speaker, just in the same way you play a song through your MP3 player. So I can listen to neurons listening to sound. And I'm going to play you a little sound file in a second listening to that. But I'll explain a little about what you'll hear. You'll hear something that sounds a lot like noise. And superimposed over the top, you'll hear sort of sharp crackles. And after a couple of seconds, you'll hear there's a sort of rhythmic bursting that happens about once a second. And that's because I've started to play a sound, which the ear has detected, the brain has decoded, and this neuron is listening to. And you'll hear that burst happen sort of once a second a few times over. So this is good fun. We can listen to neurons. <laughs> I think this is good fun. I'm a neuroscientist. <laughs> we can listen to neurons listening to sounds. Um, but what do we do with this? We can only take this so far. One of the first things we do is we take the time at which these spikes occur. And we can then plot these in, in different ways. So I'm going to walk you through this. And we have a series of white dots. Each white dot is a time when that neuron fired its spike, that little sound that you could hear. And I've taken 600 millisecond chunks of time, and there's about 30 of them, and they're organized in rows. And at the beginning, at time zero each time, I've presented a sound. It's about 100 milliseconds long. You can see that from the white bar at the bottom. And what you can see is that this neuron is spiking in response to the sound. So it's elevating its spike rate. It's telling us that it heard sound. And we can compare that to a similar set of times when we didn't present a sound. And you can see there's a difference here. We can also ask, what happens when we present a visual stimulus? In this case, not very much. And we can also play the sound and present the visual stimulus at the same time. And we can see that this neuron has a response that looks really just like its response to sound. So this is an auditory neuron in auditory cortex listening to sounds. This is what we expect. This is how the brain should work. But for about a third or a half of neurons, this is not the case. So we have other neurons that look a bit like this. So here we have a neuron that responds to sound. It responds in a slightly different way to the visual stimulus. And when we present the two together, we get a response that looks like the sum of those two unisensory responses. And we have a, a yet more curious example here, where we have a neuron that doesn't respond to sound. It maybe responds weakly to the light flash. But when we present the two together, we get quite a reliable response. So what are these neurons doing in auditory cortex? Why? are sound responsive bits of your brain that we know are processing your ability to listen, responding to visual stimuli? And why are they perhaps waiting for particular combinations of auditory and visual stimuli? What's the purpose here? Well, that's really the area of research that my lab is really actively engaged in. And to begin to answer these questions, we turn to perception. So we ask, are there occasions when what you see can actually change what you hear or manipulate it in some way? And it's actually a really good example of that going on right now, this minute. So you're listening to me. You're probably under the illusion that my voice is coming from my mouth, because that's where voices normally come from. And you can see my mouth moving, and it's in time with my voice. But of course, I'm wearing a microphone, and the speakers are there to the left and right at the back of the room. And your brain has been completely tricked, I imagine, into believing that my voice is coming from a source here. So this is the ventriloquism illusion. It's been around for hundreds of years. <laughs> And it underlies a puppeteer's ability to throw his voice. So by moving uh, a puppet's mouth in time with what he's saying, and of course not moving his mouth, which is the clever bit, he can trick you into thinking that this puppet is speaking. So how does that work? Well, when you're faced with a complicated scene and you're trying to localize a sound, your auditory system is quite good at telling where a sound came from. It's got a resolution of about one degree. And one degree is equivalent to holding your thumb out at arm's length, and the width of your thumb is roughly a degree of space. So that's actually quite, you know, it's a narrow window on the world. We can sort of show that here like this. You can see within that window, there's still a number of people. Your visual system, by contrast, is actually much better. So the spatial acuity of your visual system is more like 0 0.02 degrees, so 50 times better. So you can get a much more accurate perception of what you're seeing or where a source is by looking at it than by listening to it. So if your visual system estimates that the source is someplace different from where your auditory system does, then actually your brain just disregards the auditory information and makes you believe that this coherent source is where you can see it. So 
Is that always the case? We're primates, we're heavily dominated by vision, we have very sophisticated visual systems. Is it just the case that if you give the brain conflicting information, it says, well, vision wins. We're gonna do an experiment now and see if that's the case. Your job as the subject in this experiment is to look at this white cross. And in a second, some number of flashes is gonna appear below the white cross. And you simply have to count the number of flashes that you see. There's gonna be one flash or two flashes. So who saw one? And who saw two? Okay, so there's a bit of a mix there. So if I play that again without any sound, there's really clearly one flash. So this is an example of something called the flash beep illusion. So it's first described by uh, Shams and his colleagues. And the basis of it is that you have two very rapidly presented sounds and a single light flash. And usually you'll see there as two flashes. So your brain will actually create a second flash. Why does that occur? Well, the temporal resolution of your visual system is slower than your auditory system. So your auditory system is incredibly fast. You can determine differences in the arrival of sounds at your two ears in the order of microseconds, so fractions of a fraction of a second. In contrast, your visual system is relatively slow. So it takes time for light to hit the back of the eye. It takes time for the photoreceptive elements there to detect that light and turn it into an electrical signal. In contrast, your cochlea is very quick at decoding the vibration that occurs there because of a sound wave and turning that into electrical activity. So actually your brain is very good at doing statistics. It essentially estimates how reliable a signal is and it takes that reliability into account when it combines information from different sources. So if you have a particularly blurry image, it's much less likely to capture the location of a sound than a very precise one. So what happens if we have signals that are equally reliable? We're gonna see a quick movie in a second. And again, I'm gonna ask you to watch this chap and just try and work out what he's saying. Ba, 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 ba. So he's perhaps underestimated ba, your intelligence because he seems to be repeating himself a lot. Ba, but you probably agree ba, that he's all saying ba. And what about now? Ba, 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 ba. Anyone wants to take a guess ba, at what he's saying? Ba. Excellent. <laughs> so we'll listen to it again. This time, close your eyes. Ba, ba. So he's actually still saying ba. bar, but if we play the movie on its own, we can see he's mouthing far. So he says bar, he mouths far, you perceive var. So what's going on here? Well, in this case, your brain is creating something from the two signals that wasn't there in either of them in the first place, but it's, it's kind of best guess at what these two conflicting pieces of information could be telling you. These illusions are all kind of good fun, um, but in the lab, we can use them by putting information in conflict to estimate how the brain makes its decisions, how it weights information to actually reach a kind of perceptual judgment about things. And as a neuroscientist, that means that I can make testable hypotheses about what these visual responses we saw in auditory cortex might actually be doing. Of course, for the brain, these are just one of the myriad of ways that it's evolved to make sense of this exceedingly colorful and busy and sometimes conflicting world that we find around us.